thank you very much for joining today and uh, I'll do a quick recap of what we discussed in the first session and we'll move forward from there so basically we are trying to make sense of uh, this enormous tragedy uh, that we are experiencing in terms of the coronavirus and we'll look at what can spirituality help us to go, th uh, go through with it. So the first part I talk about is the spiritual wisdom that comes from the divine in terms of helping us understand who we are at our core that can give us inner shelter, that can give us an inner sense of calmness. So that was look within. I talked about how we have focused a lot in the, in the recent years, in recent centuries, in gaining outer power but not in gaining inner power. And thus when we are put in a situation of outer powerlessness, we feel as if there is nothing we can do. But there is much we can do. And that is we can grow internally. And now I look at, yes, we may talk all about growing internally, but we still need to face the outer world. And how do we go about facing that? So that's what I'll discuss. So I'll be talking in three broad parts. Does God will everything? Does... Uh, Does God help us? And if he helps us, then how does he help us? So firstly, does God will everything? Will means, is it that everything that happens, including, say, the enormous disaster that is happening, is this God's will? This is one of the most fundamental questions that we face when we consider, when we try to adopt a theistic or a spiritual worldview, that... Uh, how do we make sense of the enormous suffering that is there in life? Or we could put from more, in a more common terms as, you know, there are so many good people and why do good people have terrible things happening to them? So let's go to the next slide. So I believe that, uh, so there are broadly, you know, does God will everything? No. There are three factors which shape the way things happen in the world. We could put them as God's will, free will and evil. So God's will is of course the supreme cause. Without that nothing would happen. But God's will is not the cause for specific things that happen in the world. So we could say that God provides the framework within which we function. The example given in the Bhagavad Gita is in 9, 9 chapter 6 verse That there is a ocean that if you consider the vast sky, in that sky the wind moves up, down, left, right. But while the wind moves in this way, essentially the sky doesn't determine the specific movement of the wind. The sky determines the area of the movement of the wind. If you consider wind moving in the sky. So similarly, we have our free will. And God doesn't control our free will. So our free will operates within God's will. But our free will is not... Uh, determined by God. So it's like a framework is given for us. Within that framework, we choose what we do. So another example to understand this could be, say, rainy season. And now the rains are the cause of the growth of all vegetation on the earth. But in some places, uh, fruits grow, some places just weeds or thorns, thorny stuff grows. So why is the, why the difference? The difference is because of what is sown on the ground. So without the rains, nothing would happen. There would be no vegetation. But the rains are not responsible for what specific vegetation occurs. 
भैर सो इन दैट सेंस उपद्रष्टा अनुमंता च गॉड इज द ओवर सीयर एंड परमिटर द भगवीता सेज इन थर्टीन ट्वेंटी थ्री ही इज नॉट द डूअर ऑफ एवरीथिंग ही इज नॉट सो नाउ देर इज गॉड्स विल एंड देर इज फ्री विल सो वी हैव आर फ्री विल एंड समटाइम्स वी 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 आर सेल्स डू थिंग्स दैट वी आर नॉट प्राउड ऑफ we are sometimes we do sometimes things which we deeply regret so that's all free will and beyond that there is evil now evil what does it mean literal uh, actually so basically we could separate to understand what is evil let's separate it in two broad parts can you go to the next slide there is natural evil and there is moral evil so moral evil refers to the the bad things that are done by people the, uh, so for example sometimes people somebody may rob somebody may murder somebody may in one some way or the other do something which is which is evil and so the actions of people when they misuse their free will that comprises moral evil and now moral evil has consequences now what are the consequences of moral evil that the reactions of moral evil come as natural evil natural evil basically refers to the the kind of uh, say natural calamities it could be tsunamis it could be earthquakes it could be <clears throat> various kinds of disasters that come upon us so that means nature seems to be acting in a evil way toward us the bhagavad gita basically say that there are three main things in existence tatvatraya three three truths there is the uh, there is god there is nature and there is the soul so prakriti jiva and ishvara or in, if you want to use alliterative names for it sometimes it is called as jeev jagat and jagdish jeev is we the souls we the living beings jagat is nature or the universe and jagdish is the divine so now so going back to the previous two causes what we looked at it see we have there is god's will there is free will and when that free will is misused repeatedly that leads to evil so now is evil a independent agent not exactly a separate agent who is out to destroy us that is not the understanding of the gita the gita does not talk about any separate being like a devil or a satan who is independent of god and who is opposed to god but evil is basically the accumulation and the reaction uh, for whatever misuse of free will that we do now this misuse can happen at various this misuse accumulation and reaction can happen at various levels say for example somebody is an alcoholic now they drink once twice thrice four times five times and then that person becomes so habituated to drinking that they might do eventually do terrible things to somehow get their hands on a drink there was a russian uh, when the vodka was at one time in russia the price of vodka had increased a lot so they had made a alcoholism awareness commercial so it was there was a family the child was then they were looking and they said the news said that the vodka price has increased so then the child the son fearfully asked his father father will you drink less now that the vodka price has increased and the father says no you will eat less so now what parent would want to cause their child to starve so that they can, they will themselves drink more now that's where Uh, by the repeated misuse of free will a person can become so desensitized that they do terrible things but they don't realize it that is moral evil mm. so at a extreme level we can have sociopaths psychopaths 
people who just do wrong and not only they do not they don't feel that they are doing anything wrong rather they feel as if they are doing something uh, something right something wonderful and uh, beyond that there is natural evil natural evil means the reaction that comes to it when we do something wrong repeatedly that gets accumulated so one reaction that comes is uh, that within the per alcoholic itself the urge to drink becomes so strong just it overpowers them but another way the reaction to the misuse of the free will comes is through nature now in today's world we have exploited and destabilized and uh, abused nature in various ways and that abuse of nature can lead to reactions <clears throat> so now <clears throat> that the according to most uh, mainstream understanding whatever research we have if you look at not just the coronavirus but most recent pandemics have uh, of course not pandemic but major diseases whether we consider sars or h1n1 or before that swine flu or whatever most of these have accumulated in some way or must uh, they have been triggered some way or the other associated with uh, with animal farming animal far no, animal farming is uh, is a euphemism for organized mass slaughterhouses so now of course the point here is that two things that <coughs> human beings have always eaten meat we have canine teeth with which you can eat meat if you want to but the sheer magnitude of how much uh, how many animals are killed millions and millions are killed every day and animals are grown to be killed and then they're not allowed to live in a natural way all this is serious now of course that is not the only way when we have this disrupted the environment but there are many other ways in which uh, we have disturbed delicate ecological balances the earth, earth is groaning under the burden of what we have done so there is some reaction to that so now when when there are reaction when we misuse our free will and there are reactions to that that is not god's it is not god's will in the sense that it is not that god wanted us to do bad things or god wanted bad things to happen to us rather it is just a natural reaction to a particular action uh, a simpler example to illustrate this point that suppose somebody steps off from a 10 story building and then they crash and they get severe fractures uh, then now is it god who caused the fracture then no it is there's a law of gravity so the law of gravity means that if the if there is action there will be a reaction to that so it's not that god caused the person to suffer it is just that if there is action there will be a reaction now imagine if somebody were falling from a not a 10 story building from maybe they fall from a aircraft and maybe they are so caught in their own uh, thing they don't even notice they are falling so if they are maybe then if they don't notice they are falling then they come and crash what happened what happened how did i crash like that but from the moment the aircraft started crashing or they fell off the aircraft or whatever happened the descent is going on for a long time and it is not that gravity has a personal agenda against anyone gravity is simply a law of nature so now <clears throat> so basically the first point which i am making is uh, how does all this related with the uh, with the current corona crisis let's move forward can you go ahead next slide we have so uh, till now i talked about what is god's role so god is not the cause of what happens so now does god help us to deal with situations how does god help so to understand god's provision we need god's vision god's vision means 
that we need knowledge to understand how the help is being offered. Now, this is not very difficult to understand. Suppose somebody has got some severe pain in the belly and then the doctor says we have to operate you. At one level, surgery itself means further pain. It's cutting the body. We say, I have pain and you are giving me more pain. But that pain is the way to cure pain. So, unless one has some medical knowledge to understand the doctor's actions, one may feel, is the doctor helping me or hurting me? Similarly for us, if you want to understand God's vision, God's provision, how does God help? We need to get a, a more philosophical vision as given the wisdom texts, like the Bhagavad Gita. Go ahead. So, now why some things happen? To understand that, we can look at these three levels of causation. So, whatever happens, say, now on the left side, is say the presently, we suppose somebody is afflicted by, we are all afflicted by the corona crisis, even if we are not personally infected by it. But suppose consider there is somebody who is infected. Now, there is the immediate cause, there is the remote cause and there is the ultimate cause. So, the immediate cause for the suffering is the virus and there is a remote cause for it which is the past karma of the person and the past action that they have done that is the combination of the free will and the evil and there is an ultimate cause that is disconnection from God. We discussed earlier about how we are all spiritual beings and when we say we are spiritual beings that means that each one of us is a part of the divine is a part the part of a uh, part of the divine as spiritual beings and we are uh, at that level beyond as spiritual beings we are unaffected by material upheavals so <clears throat> the ultimate cause for our situation is the disconnection from god often material existence is compared to an ocean and in this ocean, at times, there is the understanding that <clears throat> we may have to go through. Uh, in the ocean, there can be turbulence. Sometimes there are might. Sometimes the ocean is smooth. Sometimes there are waves. Sometimes there are huge waves. Sometimes there are tsunamis. So now. Uh, Whatever be the specific nature of the uh, wave in the ocean, first of all, if the person is in the ocean, then there, there is certain amount of distress, certain amount of vulnerability to disaster that is there. So we are disconnected from God and we are placed in the material world, which is a place of vulnerability. So that is the ultimate cause. Beyond that ultimate cause, there are specific causes that lead to specific reactions. So there is an immediate cause and there is a remote cause. And so in the case of somebody say getting affected by the uh, disease, the coronavirus, so, so they get infected by someone. So now there are cases where say people, <clears throat> one person who is infected, they don't know they are infected and they, they mix with other people and there is no adequate social distancing, then they cause uh, they cause trouble to others. They, uh, now, they might associate with 100 people and out of those 100, maybe 50 get infected or 20 get infected or 70 get infected. Now, what exactly determines who gets infected and who doesn't get infected? Now, we may say it's immunity, but you know, it may well be that sometimes some people have high immunity, but still they go through difficulties, still they suffer. Why is that? So that's because we need to understand that it's not just the immediate cause that is the immediate cause that is there. The immediate cause is of course important and the immediate cause needs to be addressed, no doubt. But the immediate cause is not the complete cause. Beyond the immediate cause, there is the remote cause and then there is the ultimate cause. So, uh, we will look at the whatever happens, it is a combination of the immediate and the remote. Sometimes some people might seem to have high immunity and still they get infected. We see this especially with respect to say heart disease. 
you know, people who have never had any heart problems at all, they might just get one heart attack and that might turn out to be fatal. And somebody who is very vulnerable, they have a lot of heart issues, but still nothing happens to them. They live on for a long, long time sometimes. People, they live on longer than their heart specialist, cardiac specialist doctors. Although they are much more serious heart patients and the doctor is perfectly healthy. So, uh, what, now, so the immediate cause is there, but the immediate cause is not the complete cause. The immediate cause is correct, but not complete. And when something happens to us, it's a combination of immediate and remote causes. And that combination is often an unpredictable in terms of which contributes how much. Sometimes, if we look at our lives, we do some minor mistake and we get a severe consequence of that. And sometimes we do a major mistake and we don't get much a result of that. Suppose somebody is driving on a car, driving a car and they just, uh, they handle a phone. And during that time, maybe somebody else drives across the road and they hit them and there's a calamity. Now sometimes some people while driving, they're, they're tired or bored and they nod off. And they might drive, there's a straight smooth road with not much traffic. They might drive on for a long, long time and nothing happens. So what happens is the immediate cause is there. So in, in the case of the person just looking at the phone for maybe half of, for maybe just a second, that's a minor immediate cause. But the, the remote cause is if, if there is some kar negative karma that has to be addressed over there, that has to be undergone, uh, then what may happen is that immediate cause is minor 1%, the remote cause is 99% and the person goes through big trouble. On the other hand, if that person doesn't have that remote cause to deal with, then what may happen is the person might sleep while driving and they keep sleeping for several minutes, but nothing happens. Several minutes might be a bit too much, but I know one person who said that they, they were driving early morning and they were nothing happened to them. They practically got off their one straight road from their home to the place where they were driving. And he said, I don't even remember how I drove. There were no signals at that time. So for several minutes they were driving, but nothing happened. So sometimes the immediate cause might be 99 percent. I mean, terrible mistake is we happened at the immediate level, but nothing is, if there's no remote cause, then the result might not be there. So now what is, why do we need to understand this? We are trying to make sense of, why are we discussing all this? We are trying to make sense of how uh, we can access God's grace or we can sense God's karuna amid the situation, the situations of distress that we experience in the world. So when we understand the three level of causality, then we can understand where God's role comes in. Can you go ahead? So now the immediate cause needs to be addressed. Now each of these causes has to be addressed at different levels. So how do we address the immediate cause? Now we, not we as specific individuals, general people, but we have scientists, we have researchers, they are trying to find vaccines, cures. Uh, and now it is God who inspires them from within. If you look at the history of the advancement of human knowledge, whatever field be it in science or literature or art or music, it's a, it's a significant role is played in that a by, by, by inspiration. Inspiration basically means that uh, oh, oh, we have been thinking about a particular issue, but suddenly the answer comes to us as if fully formed. We did not seek it, but we just got it. Where did it come from? We don't know, but we just get it. So that is God's inspiration for us uh, and so we can to address at the immediate level now 
we understand that if any solution comes it is god who is providing that solution that doesn't mean we don't give credit to the researchers who put in the hard work is yes, they put in the hard work and there was uh, some divine inspiration which came so we don't when we talk about seeing god's grace it is not that we expect or demand some kind of miraculous intervention that some magic wand is played and suddenly everything is addressed everything is mitigated no there is uh, now this is in sometimes science and uh, religion if you want to use that word right now the word has a negative connotation and <clears throat> the preferred word is today spirituality i won't go much into the difference between religion and spirituality but spirituality usually connotes more of open minded exploration of truth whereas <clears throat> religion often can occur a narrow minded uh, adherence to dogma to doctrines and rituals but whichever way we want to look at it uh, sometimes science and religion are put as in contradiction uh, but it is not like that if we consider a broad spiritual understanding within which there are certain religious practices then this spiritual understanding includes the scientific understanding that there are immediate causes and the immediate causes need to be addressed at the immediate level so for example even in the even in the uh dharmic traditions of india there was a well advanced branch of knowledge called uh, <coughs> ayurveda branch of medical knowledge and ayurveda was not just uh, praying to god uh, to heal the sick there is a sophisticated system of study of herbs and their characteristics and their effects and is, uh, so that okay this is the material imbalance in the body and this is the material that will rebalance the body so there's the addressing of immediate immediate cause is also a part of the spiritual tradition and now at one level we need to get the inter, we need to know a cure but to apply the cure also there is god's grace comes in when we have to address the immediate cause it strengthens our intelligence and our self mastery <clears throat> if somebody is an alcoholic now if they want to give up alcoholism they need self mastery they need self discipline so now if we if we pray to god if we connect with god then that devotion clarifies our intelligence that increases our will power and this way when we have to take some practical precautions sometimes you might be nonchalant sometimes you might be careless uh, careless but if you understand that actually uh, i am doing this because it's a service to god i am doing this because i i am a part of god and i am here to act responsibly as a human being in this world in a mood of service and devotion contribution then that gives us a higher motivation to be responsible to use our intelligence to use our uh, self mastery and act responsibly so for whatever precautions are required to be taken they need to be taken but they can be taken with spiritual understanding and we may may be, we may well be able to take them better if we have spiritual understanding Uh, because we will become more conscious and more cautious by that way that's addressing the immediate cause then we go to the next slide that is addressing the remote cause the remote cause is basically the karma that we have done in the past and that karma which we have done in the past will have its results now what will be those results there is purification and there is minimization so purify when we address the remote uh, karma how do we address that there are various forms of prayers ritual sacrifices there are various uh, practices which we may do and these are meant to address things at the remote cause now the remote cause is also one level of cause cause causality <clears throat> generally the more knowledge we have 
the more options open for us to deal with difficulties say no, knowledge expands our vision of what is happening and then we can have a multi pronged approach so for example now with respect to the corona crisis uh, we understand that okay if we have some basic knowledge okay i should not associate closely with the infected person that with that knowledge i can address it at that level if somebody is infected then uh, they can address it at that level the doctors will address it okay treat the patient for what, whatever is possible uh, now so this we could say social distancing is one way of addressing the problem then treatment is another way of addressing the problem but now we could decrease uh, we could freeze the international borders by which people uh, who may might be carriers of germs ca carriers of the virus do not come into the country now that's not so much a medical approach it's more of a legal administrative governmental approach then we might decide that no but we it's not we have to we are a global globalized economy what do we do about the things that we need from other countries say we might do we produce them locally and that brings in economic measures so you know we can address issues at different levels at different frames of reference based on um, of the uh, the knowledge that we have so the cause of the infection is not just okay the virus came from this person to this person we can escalate the cause the cause can also be oh you know we have open borders with that country that country is infected so we might also get infected so we can have higher and higher levels of causation and uh, the different levels of causation different means can be used for addressing things so sim so similarly uh, we when there are certain prayers that are recommended uh, for chanting at a particular time so for example in the dharmic tradition narsimha is considered to be a protector so narsimha kavach mantra or narsimha mantras are often recommended to be chanted as means for protection now this what is it do what is this doing we do not deny or minimize addressing the immediate cause through the scientific means but we understand that the immediate cause is not the complete cause there is a remote cause also and the remote cause also needs to be addressed so the addressing of the immediate and remote causes it is not contradictory but complementary so science scientific methods of addressing issues and spiritual methods of addressing the uh, same problem same issues they can be complementary so what happens when we address the remote cause there is purification and minimization you remember i talked about uh, moral evil and natural evil so moral evil refers to our own tendency to do wrong when we keep doing wrong it becomes solidified with that impressions those impressions become solidified within us and they impel us to do wrong so when we worship and pray when we practice some form of propitiation of the divine some form of bhakti then what happens is there is purification from within that means the 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 tendency for moral evil decreases and there is minimization minimization means the reactions that are coming for us uh, for whatever we may have done individually or collectively those reactions can be minimized that's minimization so minimization here uh, we understand the principle of karma is not retributive it is restorative that just like in a normal state government in a normal state governmental system also the the primary purpose of the criminals is not to the primary purpose purpose of the criminal law is not to so much to punish the criminal as to reform the criminal so if uh, so similarly karma is also a system of cosmic justice and the purpose of it is not to not to punish not to give retribution but to help in restoration so now what this means is that if we start learning to live more harmoniously with nature we purify ourselves of the impulses and the drives that make us want to randomly exploit nature and the creatures within nature for our own pleasure 
then that can minimize the reactions that come so that is addressing the remote cause and then beyond that there is addressing the ultimate cause so we address the ultimate cause as the next slide by the practice of by the direct practices of bhakti yoga so our resources that is the various resources for developing a devotional connection with the divine here when we are developing the devotional connection there is a change in the conception of the divine we often pray to god as the fulfiller of our desires the desire can be for some gain or for getting some gain or for avoiding some pain whichever way it is it's a desire krishna talks about in the bhagavad gita talks about two of these categories of people artho and artharthi those who are desiring removal of pain and those who are desiring the gaining of the desires uh, gaining of their uh, maybe craving for whatever they want so one vision of god is as the fulfiller of desires so in this understanding we don't see just god as the uh, we are not interested in god per se we are interested primarily in what god gives us but beyond that a more holistic understanding is that uh, uh, that in the bhakti tradition especially it is described that god is all attractive he is himself the fulfillment of desires and we stay in the material ocean as long as we think material things are desirable and crave to enjoy them but when our desires become directed towards the divine as the source of the supreme satisfaction when we see him as the fulfillment of all desires then that is how we address the ultimate cause so that's how we basically get out of the ocean and this is krishna talks about this in 719 the bhagavad gita where he says this may require multiple lifetimes of spiritual evolution bahunam janmana mante gyanavan mam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha so bahunam janmana mante might take many lifetimes but what happens by that eventually vasudeva sarvamiti one understands that vasudeva the supreme lord is everything he is the be all and the end all and understanding this is very powerful so now with this three level of causation uh, let's look at how can we help god to help us so how does god help us by helping us in various ways to address the immediate remote and ultimate causes now we have also heard that god helps those who help themselves so how do we help god to help us as the last part of our discussion so this is a little concentrated slide but i think there are four points which i am going to talk about here and this is the acronym meta which i am using that we discuss about the immediate remote and uh, ultimate cause so so for all these what do we do okay that acronym is not sequence right over there if we mitigate immigrate tolerate and appreciate so mitigate means that wherever there is an immediate cause that can be addressed that needs to be addressed we need to mitigate it so if somewhere somebody is not taking a medicine which they which can help them in some way they need to take that medicine that's mitigation at a practical level then tolerate is uh, sorry then emigrate uh, let's go in this way over here tolerate is what <clears throat> we understand that there are certain factors which are not in our control so the immediate cause is for us to address the remote cause it's already been initiated we can't do much about it so that is not uh, that we have to tolerate it we have to uh, wait through it we understand that the world that we live in is characterized by temporariness everything is temporary our bodies are temporary our lives are temporary Uh, so even the most promised pleasures in the world are temporary but similarly the most feared troubles are also temporary so they will end they will end so that we need to tolerate them so the results of the remote cause need to be tolerated we have to be patient 
and like now we are being advised to hunker down if the government decides a period of lockdown or shutdown then we all have to tolerate it and then tolerance can seem very passive and disempowering but there is a third op thing that we can do that is immigrate immigrate means that we raise our consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level so the ultimate immigration is when we relocate from material reality to spiritual reality that is what is often called as liberation or attainment of the kingdom of god or the spiritual world now that is that that is also a process that goes on lifelong in terms of the elevation of our consciousness so when we <clears throat> practice spirituality and we learn to shelter our consciousness in something beyond the material when we emigrate our consciousness we will find that the worldly upheavals will disturb us less in general <clears throat> what we fear reflects what we hold dear what we fear reflects what we hold dear so if somebody is say very attached to say sports cricket then if their favorite team loses it's devastating for them devastating for them but if somebody is very attached to politics then if their preferred party gets defeated they feel it's it's a disaster but somebody is say not interested in cricket or not interested in politics then the, the events may happen but they don't impact them that much so what what agitates us most re reveals what we have invested ourselves in the most so when we emig emigrate means by the prog progressive practice of bhakti our center of attachment relocates from the uh, from the physical objects of the world to the supreme spiritual object beyond this world so when we raise our consciousness to the spiritual level that ensures that we don't get that much agitated and then beyond all these we need to see that whatever happens uh, for whatever reason we appreciate it as an opportunity for spiritual growth that things there there are things which ever happen now there is a cause for things and there is a purpose for things the cause is often very difficult to understand like i said it might be 1% immediate karma and 99% remote uh, karma rem, rem, immediate cause and remote cause we don't know what is the exact reason why something happens but we can appreciate that what that whatever be the cause why something happens which we can that cause we may not be able to know but purpose that is something which you can know the purpose for everything in life ultimately is our spiritual growth the elevation of our consciousness to the spiritual level and if we see every situation as opportunity for that we appreciate it that way then we will be able to move forward no matter what happens and that's why it's important for us to keep this vision uh, that <clears throat> can we go to the next slide here whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through the divine has different names in different traditions the bhagavad gita knows the divine by the name krishna so whatever karma may get us to uh, the krishna will get us through so that is that every situation that is there is in is uh, is we can appreciate that as a opportunity for spiritual growth why something specifically happens we don't know so in that god's grace is seen in the opportunity for us to uh, expertly choose one of the op any of the options on meta or all of these options mitigate immigrate tolerate <coughs> appreciate when we do this we'll find that god's grace is always available for us that god is there with us not somewhere up there remote uncaring or up there inflicting problems within us or on us but rather he is there with us within us to help us deal with whatever difficulties come our way mat chitta sarva durgaani mat prasada tarishyasi if you become conscious of me you will pass over all obstacles by my grace 
it is that guarantee which Krishna gives the, and it is 1858 in the Bhagavad Gita and it is this philosophically grounded conviction that can become a powerful weapon for us to move forward in our life journey. In um, tomorrow's session, I will especially talk about addressing fear practically in terms of what all we could do to face our fears, especially in a situation like this. And today I will summarize what I spoke. I started, uh, I spoke on this topic of look up and broadly we talked in three parts. First is that what is God's role in what happens in life? So is God the cause of say a disaster like the Corona crisis? We discussed about three levels that <clears throat> whatever happens there is God's will, there is free will and there is evil. So God is not the uh, desirer or intender of every specific thing that happens. The rains cause all vegetation uh, on the earth but they don't determine which vegetation grows where. <clears throat> so we all have free will and sometimes we misuse it. And the misuse of free will that, that eventually leads to evil which has two forms moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil is where we repeatedly keep doing wrong things. And then that becomes so accumulated as impressions that we don't even feel anything wrong when, while doing wrong things. And then the natural evil is the reaction to our wrong actions. So natural evil is not God having a personal vendetta against anyone. If somebody jumps down from a 10 story building, it is not that God causes them to get fractured limbs. It is just the law of gravity. Similarly, actions have reactions. There is a law of karma over there. And natural evil is the result of moral evil. And we discussed about how we have disrupted and even devastated the ecology in various ways. You caused uh, enormous pain and destruction to, mo uh, to mother nature and there will be reactions for that. So <clears throat> then I talked about okay how does God help us? We talked about to understand how God helps. Uh, we talked about three levels of causation. Anything that happens there is an immediate cause. So somebody, is, somebody ha has a sickness because of the coronavirus. The immediate cause is the contact with somebody who had that infection or somehow they got the uh, virus from somewhere but then beyond that there is the remote cause is the past karma of a person and the ultimate cause is the disconnect from them from God because of which we are caught within the material ocean material existence. So each of these needs to be addressed at its own level. So science provides us the resources to address the immediate cause. And those resources need to be valued and gratefully utilized. So we see we are grateful to the scientific researchers who are doing hard work to working hard to find a cure and we are also acknowledge we also appreciate that it is God who gives the scientists the inspiration the intelligence to find the cure. Uh, at immediate level uh, <coughs> if we have a spiritual understanding we will also become more responsible and more careful and co conscious and cautious in practicing precautions. At the level of remote cause there is minimization and pur purification and minimization. The purpose of karma is not retributive to inflict punishment but restorative. It is to bring about transformation or reformation. So if we strengthen our spiritual connection, we do some devotional practices then those what do they do? They act as expressions of our desire to reform and then when there is purification thus there will be minimization. So prayers and practices which people do which some, which some people might do in such times say like chanting Narsimha Mantra or, or some other religious practices these are not in any way they are not contradicted to the scientific they don't minimize or deny the scientific uh, solutions that they both stand complementary. <coughs> And the ultimate cause we address by uh, accessing the spiritual resources for growth that are given in the bhakti tradition. Then <clears throat> how do we deal with each of these? I talked about how we 
for the immediate cause we mitigate for the remote cause we tolerate for the ultimate cause we immigrate we raise our consciousness spiritual level and whatever we are able to do or not able to do in a particular any situation we appreciate every situation as an opportunity for spiritual growth when we function in this way we all can grow spiritually and we can rise to a higher consciousness and whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through so the journal exercise which we could do to address our to look up how can we look up practically you now we can look behind in our, our life remember any incident that seemed like an adversity but worked to be an opportunity eventually we all if we look back our lives we may find some incidents like this and they can help us broaden our vision not get caught in just the present but see the present as a part of a bigger plan and then what the current problem that we are having this meta framework in the situation that we are in what can we mitigate how can we elevate our consciousness upward uh how what can we tolerate and how can we appreciate if you apply this framework you can start sensing god's presence and god's grace even amid the situation that we are in thank you very much are there any questions i appreciate the opportunity for spiritual growth it is there for everyone because ultimately everyone is a spiritual being everyone is on a spiritual journey and uh, <clears throat> we all go through our routine life and see if we don't think about uh, bigger realities as long as we are caught in our daily routines but when the daily routines are disrupted so i start thinking what's 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 going on in life what is so this is a mega disruptor and uh, when we are when our normal life is disrupted that's why that's when we start thinking about bigger things so it is a opportunity for uh, at least some contemplation about what is the nature of reality what is our place and purpose within reality and that that can act that can trigger some spiritual contemplation that's how it's an opportunity for spiritual growth for everyone if somebody is infected by the disease itself or are you saying they are affected by the overall situation okay yeah oh it's definitely a difficult situation if somebody is directly infected there are two three broad things uh, our bodies are vulnerable and perishable and we when when our bodily resources are somehow limited in some ways then to spiritualize our consciousness is not that easy but if we try to do it if there is a supportive community or there are friends who can assist in some ways then there is the impetus for spiritual growth now how exactly it will work out somebody is sick and somebody is struggling for treatment yeah when we live in if somebody in the ocean there will be turbulence and when the waves hit at that time one will be battered by the waves but it is through all that battering uh, by the waves in the ocean one's uh, conviction that one has to get uh, to one has to make some plans to get out of the ocean that conviction increases and when there is uh, when, when somebody is infected at that time it is <clears throat> god's grace can manifest internally through some strength through some realization that we get it can manifest externally through others other spiritually minded people who might offer us some moral support some practical assistance and through all of it uh, one's uh, spiritual connection one spiritual commitment the spiritual realization increases so this is not to in any way so it's not to in any way minimize the physical challenges that come up 
but there is the circumstantial and there is the transcendental so sometimes circumstantial difficulty is what works out to be a transcendental opportunity and we look at the example of uh, Srila Prabhupada when he came to America he, he he was afflicted by two heart attacks but through that he got a mystical vision of Krishna but more than that throughout all he became convinced that this is this is the mission that I have to follow and I'm going to follow it whatever it takes and it led him to become more convinced more determined and he moved forward so exactly when something happens, why it is happening, uh, that is not so easy to understand. In tomorrow's session, I'll talk about this uh, theme broadly that when we face difficulties, how, how do we move forward through them? Uh, that uh, Why doesn't God shield us from difficulties if He loves us? But sometimes difficulties are what are necessary for our growth. So, the process of spiritual evolution requires the dissolution of our present conceptions and comforts sometimes and that's what sometimes happens okay 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 and sorry so now is a uh, fear a healthy motivator if fear is the sole motivator it is definitely unhealthy that's not at all healthy but fear is a uh, is often an essential a uh, part of any uh, process of learning <clears throat> with you ask about parenting well uh, now with social society becoming more and more fragmented there are uh, there are many families which are single parent families and the single parents often have to put in a phenomenal amount of effort to take care of children and they do uh, put in that sacrifice uh, so but still sociologically what has been found is that double parent families work children in double parent families work grow much better than in social single parent families and one reason for that is that you know, for growth a, is required a combination of con conditional and unconditional love unconditional love means you know however you whatever you do however you are I accept you I care for you I, I value you so that is unconditional love and at one level love has to be unconditional but on another level the, there is uh, the natural desire and even the responsibility for the parents that the children should grow children should themselves mature they become more responsible and becoming responsible means that you know, one has to recognize that actions have consequences so conditional love doesn't mean that children are neglected or rejected or condemned but just that there has to be some amount of discipline you do this then you will get this if you do this you'll have will get that so now it is very difficult for one parent to offer both conditional and unconditional love so if there are two parents then that division of labor can happen to some extent sometimes it is conscious sometimes it is just unconsciously uh, the roles are associated roles are uh, roles are allotted or chosen based on one's own disposition but the point is that in our relationships we want to be we want to be kind we want to be nice but we, we can't afford to be naive if we are naive we will be exploited by people so the idea is that uh, we need to uh, be reciprocal we, we are courteous and uh, courteous to everyone but then we want to develop a connection with people so if somebody is repeatedly take, just taking us for granted and using our using us for their own purposes without they growing or taking up responsibility or they helping us when we are need then we may decide do I need to invest so much in this particular relationship we can take stock of that so God loves now that brings us to the question of God 
Is God's love conditional or unconditional? It is both. God loves us as we are, but He loves us too much to let us stay as we are. God loves us as we are, and He loves us too much to let us stay as we are. So I think that that is the combination of conditional and conditional love that is that is required for any any kind of relationship. Thank you. No, 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 no. That's fine. And I just I wanted to just understand whether it, you are relating with any specific point, then I could connect and address it. But it was an important question. Thank you.